Good evening, everybody. We are privileged again to have Gordon Orians as our speaker. Gordon has led bird walks for Horizon House time after time, place after place. Gordon has a long, a distinguished experience at the university teaching uh, various uh, aspects of ecology and ornithology. And his department head may, I mean, the department may be uh, structured differently from time to time, but Gordon has been a stalwart through all. Tonight, he's gonna to be talking about something a little closer to home than some places, but very much a place that needs our understanding and that Gordon can help us to lead the temperate rainforests of the North Pacific. Thank you, Gordon. I don't need that, no. Thank you, Gene. Am I properly wired for you? Yeah. Okay, okay. Um, I got a map here, which I will use quite a bit, but first thing you need to know is every time you try to take a globe and make it on the flat map, you have some map, you have all sorts of distortions. Forget about this big, enormous thing at the bottom, which is intended to be Antarctica. Forget it, that it, is, it, isn't, it isn't really there, okay? So, but before, before I get, get into uh, talking about rainforests, I per perhaps should tell you why I feel competent to talk to you about it at all. And th the answer is that as of a, a year ago, I just completed 10 years on the board of Audubon, Alaska. And I retired off because there was a sunset clause. And when I got on the board of Audubon, Alaska, the first thing we did was to be involved with the Southeast Alaskan Rainforest, which, which Alaska, the Alaskans call Southeast. And it's a huge area. And I was, got involved with this marvelous ecological atlas of Southeast Alaska that was produced by, jointly by Audubon, Alaska and uh, Nature Conservancy of Alaska. And the point of this atlas is to provide all this kind of information about the place so that you would have a factual basis for thinking about how to how to do conservation in it. So as a part of evaluating uh, that thing, I got a, was involved in a week-long cruise around parts of Southeast Africa, Alaska, vetting the place, as a result of which we had a big conference and produced a book, North Pacific Rainforests, of which I'm the co-editor and also author of two chapters, one of the introductory ones and uh, a synthesis one at the end. So I bring some sort of experience uh, to this. You'll forgive me for sitting down, but I have trouble standing for a long time and get lightheaded. And some people think I've already pre-adapted pre for that, but anyway. <laughs> so uh, I've had extensive experience with Southeast Alaska and the rainforest, and that's what I bring to this evening talk. But before talking about it, I want to do something more general, and that is to look at the world's temperate rainforests. There isn't very much of them, and, they're, and there's some reasons why they are where, they're, where they are. So let's begin there, and then I will move into the Northwest, and, and finally look in detail at a small area, which will look at the biodiversity and the problems that we might have, and I'll suggest some conservation programs for what to do about it. It's a place where we still have a chance to do it right because most of the rainforest up there is still pretty intact. So let me start with this. First, let's uh, uh, use this map. Uh, the first thing to note is that there's not much land in the southern hemisphere. Okay, you can really see this. And one way to express that is if you were to go down to the southern hemisphere at the same latitude as Alaska and go around the globe there, you would be over water 98% of the time. 98%. You'd have a little bit of the tip, a little bit of southern tip of South America and a bit of New Zealand. That's the only time you'd be over land. So uh, 
there's a very unequal distribution of land, and this becomes important and then part of why our Northwest Pacific rainforest is, is especially, especially interesting and valuable. Uh, the other thing to notice here is the big belt of arid land, uh, which is, do I, do, I, do I show up on this or? Um, goes, how, how, do I, how do I tell you that? Oh, 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 okay. This big belt, okay. Thank you. Uh, this big belt here, that's the arid belt of the world. And that's where the air is descending, warming and drying, and it doesn't rain much. And that goes across this mid elevations, and that's all concentrated all over in the northern hemisphere, again, because there isn't any land down in the southern hemisphere. So for temperate rainforest to develop, it has to be at higher latitude than this arid belt. Uh, because the, there's, so they're going to be distributed at higher latitudes, but there's a very limited place where they find, as you can see uh, in this map, which shows where the, rain, the temperate rainforests of the world are actually, actually located. And there's not very much of them. So uh, the re there's reasons then why there isn't much of it, because there's only a few places where it can be. So it's got to be where the rain is in getting uh, increasingly high again, but also uh, where uh, there's uh, places where it really gets concentrated and where particularly where adjacent to the to the, to the coast are, are mountain ranges, which trap a lot of moisture. So you get, you get areas of high concentration of moisture, which gives you a temperate rainforest. And that doesn't occur in very many places, as you can see from this map. So let's just start with the biggest, and actually the most important of the temperate rainforests, and that's the one on the Pacific coast right here, and where we're a part of it. Um, and it extends uh, from California up to the Gulf of Alaska, and it's by far the largest and the most interesting, and I'll spend a lot of time uh, talking about it. But another thing you notice about this, that the New World is skinny, and the mountain ranges all run north and south. Uh, so that when things are expanding after glaciers, as ours, because if, we if I were giving this talk 15, um, a um, thousand years ago, we, we, were, uh, we would be buried under ice, okay? So where we see the rainforest today is very, very recent because it wasn't there very long ago. So there's a map in time. And as we look at it and think about doing conservation there, we all remember that it's not, it hasn't looked like this for very long, and it isn't going to look like this very long either. It's going to be different. And that's going to be central to how we think about doing conservation in this rainforest. But in the, in the new world, the mountain ranges are running north and south. There are no barriers to moving. So if you look at the next one down to the Chilean coast, uh, which is a very imp important rainforest, uh, it's also about the same latitude. And, and you get the, the mirror image uh, toward the tropics. It's arid, the most arid place in the world, like, like going out down to the Baja California. And as you head further south away from the equator, it gets wetter and wetter and wetter. So it's a mirror image of what we have here. But you will notice it's got no backup. There's no other land behind it. You've got a, a, rainforest, a mountain range right there by the coast, and that's all there is compared to what we have, where the North Pacific coastal rainforests have an enormous basin, which I will talk about. Which, and that's the only one that has that. Now another one is uh, parts of Tasmania and New Zealand. Uh, and this is a, a isolated archipelago, very small area. And my, mountainous islands always have impoverished biotas. And the, re the fundamental reason is, one, it's hard to get there, so there's not, not a lot of colonization. In small areas, you have a, uh, and you have high rates of extinction that are not replenished by uh, immigration. So you have impoverished uh, floras and faunas. When Europeans arrived in New Zealand to look around, the only mammal in New Zealand besides human beings were bats. Um, and 
all the all the other the other mammals that have been are you found in New Zealand now were introduced since Captain Cook looked ashore, uh, and what you had instead were large birds, moas of various species, uh, and were not used to any. It had no experience whatsoever with a with a terrestrial ape. Didn't know what to make of it. So if you wanted a moa for dinner, you just walked up and clubbed it. And that's exactly what the Maoris did. They started at the North Island and clubbed their way south and eliminated all of them. And so overdoing and causing extinctions is not a modern thing. We've been doing it for a long time. We've just gotten better at it. That's all. But this is a classical story. And when Captain Cook arrived, uh, the, the people were miserable. And what were they eating as the only source of meat? Cannibalism. So that's that's the story there. So, uh, in both of these, the, in the in the Chile and the uh, most of the trees there are not conifers, and they're rather they are what we, what we know as southern beeches. The genus Nothofagus. The northern beech is the genus Fagus. Uh, the southern beaches are nothophagous. And if you look at the, the little, they got like little beech leaves. But, but they make towering trees. Some of them are deciduous. Some of them are evergreen. And I can show you pictures, which I don't have um, with me, of, of the Chilean rainforest. And you can't tell that they're not conifers from a distance. They look a lot alike. But it's built. And the same is true over there in, Tas in Tasmania and, uh, and uh, 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 New Zealand, that mostly they're not conifers. So we tend to think uh, uh, rainforest has got to have conifers because that's what ours is, but that's, that's not what it is everywhere and that's not what it is there. I want to spend a little time looking at an outlier up there. It's called Norway. Um, and this is different because if you, these places I've talked about so far all have towering trees. In fact, the tallest trees in the world are in these rainforests, these temperate rainforests, taller than the tropical trees. Uh, and there's reasons for that that I'll come back to. Norway, if you go to the, the areas in Norway, it does have the conifers and stuff, but the trees are small. You don't have big trees there. It's not that the climate isn't okay. Sitka spruce is planted widely in, in northern England, and it does famously. Climate's just fine. So what's wrong with Europe? Uh, what's wrong with Norway? Uh, I'm going to speculate about this, that this is something that I've thought about, and it's not something I've read about. So this is, this is Gordon, um, and you can take it with large grains of salt accordingly. But the European is different from all these others, is that as the glaciers retreated, and they were followed by large mammals and human beings that we're hunting things. The areas I've talked about, northwest to Chile, New Zealand, there weren't people there. There were no, no human beings around. So as the, the glaciers retreated and the, and the forest expanded in northwest Europe, uh, there were human beings hunting big mammals, causing fires. And to get these great big tall trees, you need long, long times because the only reason for getting small or tall is to get your leaves up above the everybody else is going to shade you and uh, tall trees and woods are the price that the tree plays to get its leaves above the competition so if there isn't that time for going and and long uh, generation times there just is no uh, situation for the development of the kind of of environment and long-term uh, succession that leads to very small trees, uh, very tall trees. So that's my guess as to why uh, the European thing, if you go there, there's lots of pretty trees uh, and there's some nice stuff in Western Norway yet, but the trees are small. They're not big. And I, I don't think they ever were. And the fossil record, Europe is very poor in trees, uh, very poor. And you can see that uh, when the glacier comes, you've got to go south. You've got a big barrier for going south. You see, it's called the Mediterranean. 
And what do you got on the other side of this Mediterranean, the world's biggest desert? So where do things go? So a lot of things got squeezed out. So Europe is kind of a poor outlier, but uh, the climate is right. And I think this is the, my explanation of the history, why it is that uh, the rainforest of, of the Norwegian coast, beautiful as it is, has only small trees. Okay, so this is kind of a bit, a bit of an overview of where we find these, uh, these forests and uh, why they're so limited in, in distribution and, and why, uh, for the most part, uh, they were places where until quite recently there weren't any people. And to put it mildly, we're a big deal. <laughs> so let's say I'm, I'm supposed to know how to move this thing here. Uh, Japan is all, I, I don't know the J Japan situation at all, but it's, it's, it's tiny, again, an island, a remote island, where it was with people for a long time. This has also been one where there's, there have been people around. Thank you for bringing that up, uh, where it's been people around for, all, for a long, long time. So uh, the, the North and South America and the, the uh, New Zealand areas where there were no people. All of this happened without people around. And when people come, it changes everything. Um, so I've got to see what I, I'm, okay. Uh, so let's look up to the, to the upper right, and that's, that's our forest. Did it, did it, wait, you didn't get it. I went too far? I want to go back one to this one, sorry. That's okay, no worries. Yeah, there we are. There we are. This is this is our forest, and it's a magnificent. It extends from uh, the mountains of, south of San Francisco up to the Gulf of Alaska, and it's long and thin, uh, and it's composed also as we go of thousands and thousands of islands. Uh, as we go from south to north, uh, it gets cooler and wetter, uh, and, the, and as you get further north, the growing season gets shorter and shorter, uh, and various other things are changing. So at the southern limits of this marvelous rainforest, and so the, into the mountains south of San Francisco, uh, it's hugging the coast, and it's there only because the trees can ex and extract an enormous amount of moisture from fog. And the redwood trees exist in the fog belt. And the, the rainforest tree that's down there at that bottom is the redwood. And it, it exists in the fog belt. And the redwood is perfectly designed to capture fog. And it's in the fog belt. And if you stay, go in the redwood forest in the summer in the fog, you can stand there. And it's dripping. The, rain, the raindrops are falling incredibly on you. And so uh, that's what. Uh, enables that rainforest to be there because it is harvesting fog. Uh, and uh, it sort of reminds me of Robert Frost's wonderful poem of uh, San Francisco that uh, it starts, uh, dust blowing around the town unless a sea fog lays it down. And I was one of the kids who was told some of the dust in the air was gold. The mar marvelous poem. Anyway, uh, so the fog, it becomes, and the fog belt is what maintains it. Then as we come north here, it, uh, it, it gets a little cooler, but it, it gets still extremely wet. And so and in many ways, the most magnificent expression of this rainforest is on the Olympic Peninsula, uh, where we have a longer growing season, a little bit warmer, uh, enable you to get uh, great big trees. Uh, and and, and wonderful stuff. Uh, but uh, interestingly enough, the, uh, uh, what we still get in the way of disturbance, very rarely but occasionally, even this far north, is fire. And it, it is rare that we get fire. But if you go into the Olympic rainforest, you're on the whole river there. And what are the biggest trees there? Douglas firs. And they're all several hundred years old goes back to the last fire. 
Occasionally it still burns. And you know there have been some terrific burns in Western Washington and Western Oregon, but they occur very, very, it takes really hot and unusual conditions to get the rainforest dry enough that it'll burn. But occasionally it does. And that's what the Douglas fir then seeds in. And there's been no recruitment there of those Douglas firs for hundreds of years, but they're waiting for the next fire. Now as we go further north, it doesn't fire. Fire is no longer an issue. It doesn't ever get dry enough for the forest to burn. So what are the disturbances? There are, they are landslides. Uh, they're, they are uh, tree falls. Uh, they're wind blows, but no fire, no fire. So uh, but when we get into the rainforest, one of the, this temperate rainforest, one of the things that's really interesting is that there are very few tree species. Very few. You, you can get, figure out and get your guide to the, 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 the trees of the rainforest. You can do it in one morning. There's only a small number of them. As compared to a tropical rainforest with the same area, you might have 200 species. Why is that difference? Why are these rainforests so poor, poor in species that compared to the tropical forest? And the difference in terms of the kind of predators that prey upon tree seedlings. And in the tropics, or if you go to the, the understory of tropical forests, what's mostly there are seedlings of the dominant trees. There are very few other species. Whereas in the temperate rainforest, the greatest bio biological diversity is in the shrubs and stuff underneath. And those are the shrubs that have pretty flowers and fruits and all that wonderful stuff. Incredible richness in the understory. But uh, in the tropical forest, there's, there are very few understory plants. Most of the plants down there are little seedlings of the tropical trees waiting for a fire or a tree fall to open it up, they can get up. And what we have in the tropics are very species-specific seed predator and predators, insects that find the, the little seedlings by coning on the adult tree and then going on and find them nearby. So the only trees that survive are ones that get carried away a long way away from the parent tree. So that prevents things from, from one tr from single tree or few species from dominating. So it's a predator driven thing. In, in, in the rainforest up here, that doesn't happen. And we don't have those uh, species specific seedling predators. And what we have to worry about there are deer and elk down at the bottom. And they don't care how far you are from a mama tree. What, what they care about is, are you in a place where they can't get at you? And so we, if you go to the Olympic rainforest, what you will see is what we call nurse logs, where they're, they're up on the logs and, and, and places where the elk can't get at them. And, and they get there till they get big enough that they can defend themselves. So that uh, there's no problem of being close to mama in, in terms of getting predated. And so we are able to get very dense single species populations and we can have just one or two three species dominating things. You can never get that in the tropical forests because the predators get it. And as an aside, there's, there's an interesting story here that relates to that that I'll just, it's a deviation from the rainforest, but I'll tell you anyway. It's the story of rubber. Rubber is a tropical rainforest tree. Uh, in fact, the name Hevia brasiliensis is the, is the scientific name of the rubber tree. And it occurs as a scattered tree in the, in the tropical rainforest there. And it's harvested by the rubber tappers. And the, the whirly wealth from the Amazon came out of rubber tappers. And they tried to prevent any of the seeds getting out. And the, the big Man Manaus opera house is built on rubber, right? And built on rubber. And it's an amazing opera house, everything brought from, from France on a hill above Manaus. It's quite an interesting little building. Uh, but you, every effort to try to grow rubber trees in plantations in South America we got destroyed by insect predators. They couldn't do it. So what happened? Despite all efforts to keep it there, some trees got snuck out. And they got transported to Southeast Asia, and they didn't, where there weren't any native predators. And so now you, can, you have vast plantations, what single species plantations of rubber in Vietnam. You can get away with it there. And that's why you have big plantation rubber there, but not in the native range of Hevia brasiliensis. 
a little side story unrelated to this, but I just find it fascinating. Um, that's, that's why rubber plantations are not in South America where the rubber tree is native. Okay, so um, we have a situation in which uh, the very few trees, because they can become, you can get monospecific dominant forests and there's no penalty for being close to mama in these forests. So we have very few species uh, and it, there's not the species specific seedling predation that forces a, a lot of variation. So we have a small, small number of tree species more diversity in non-tree species un underneath, and that's where we get flowers and, and hummingbirds and berries, and particularly a lot of berries and blueberries and related stuff that are, are dominant and provide a lot of the forage in these forests. So you get a very different uh, understory community and animals related to it, and then there's the tree uh, fauna, of the, the conifers, which uh, are all are wind-pollinated. Uh, and the cones uh, are not very tasty, and they're hard and they protect the seeds, and they're predated upon by some squirrels who harvest them, and some jays and things which also are able to crack them open and nutcrackers. So, but we have totally different floras, faunas related to the conifer trees and the understory stuff. And then as we get further north, uh, it gets cooler and cooler, and the trees grow more and more slowly until you get way up to the Gulf, and it kind of it kind of kind of peters out. Uh, now, what's interesting, however, is that these these trees there that are growing sl very slowly have very small growth rings, and they make very very high quality wood. And we'll talk a little bit later how about that might be used in the future management of these trees. Now. Another thing that I want to mention about these rainforests is the uh, strong interaction between the land and the sea. We get up in these areas, there's high mountain ranges, peaks, Mount Fairweather, which I think is 17,000 feet, is 15 feet from the shore. The topography is unbelievable up there. So the, the rain is pounding against, and you've got a, a, an incredible interchange, and it works both ways. The, the, the rivers flowing out of the, of the, of the forest um, are bringing lots of nutrients. Some, and none of this is a watershed, by the way. Uh, the, the boundary up there is how much the czar thought he owned um, and how much we could buy from him. Uh, and it was called Seward's Folly, of course. Um, and I've often wondered, and it was ridiculed, what if the Tsar hadn't decided to sell and Seward hasn't bought it and that was all Russia still? It's interesting to, uh, to postulate about what that might, might look like. But uh, the Tsar had to sell and Seward uh, bought it and um, were, even though uh, it was pilloried for it, it turns out one of the best purchases ever made in the history of human beings. So anyway, uh, what we have the, this, the, none of this involves a b watershed boundary. And even, uh, so we have in, in, in the Alaskan part up there, which is the part I will talk about a little bit more closely, is that you, you have some of the, of the rivers come from the right above the mountains right there, but some of them come through from the interior and bringing nutrients and stuff. So the rivers, are, uh, the rivers coming down out of the mountains are producing a, a, an enormous amount of nutrients and churning uh, in, the, in the coastal uh, areas. And so that what, that's what all the great productivity. And the humpback whales, which go to Hawaiian Islands and have their babies down there in the winter, they come up and they're right next to the coast. That's when, you, if you go on a, on a cruise vessel up there, the humpbacks are right there by the coast. They're not out in the open ocean, they're right there. And it's, it's an enormously productive thing, but it works both ways. Salmon, which I'm going to talk about in greater detail shortly, carry nutrients, going up to spawn, carry nutrients up, back up to the land. And then when they die, it's deposited there. And the, the predators may carry, wolves and bears may carry the, the, the carcasses away from the, from, the, from, the, from the river and deposit them there. And there are studies that show 
in these streams in Alaska that have a big salmon runs, the trees up to 100 meters or more from the, from the, from the river grow faster than trees anywhere else because they get fertilized by the salmon bodies that are then de decomposing uh, in, in the area. Uh, so we've got this incredible interchange between the land and the sea, and it's carrying nutrients in both directions. And salmon are a big part about that. So let's talk about salmon. Everybody in Seattle is happy to talk about salmon, right? Now salmon, as you all know, are a part of fish, among the fish that have life cycles that have part of it in fresh water and part of it in the ocean. You all know that. And this is called diadromy. This may be useful to you at a cocktail party sometime. <laughs> um, and, but there are both kinds. There are, there are species of fish like salmon that go up onto the land to spawn and have the earlier life stages there and then go to sea to, to grow up. But there are also fish, fish that do it the other way. They go out to sea to spawn and then come back to the fresh water to grow. And the most famous example of this is the European eel, which goes to the Sargasso Sea to, to spawn, travel across the ocean, and travels enormous distance and does the early part of the life there and then goes back to Europe and crawls up the streams and matures. Now, it's interesting, what drives that? What, why does that complicated life cycle ever, ever happen? It's because it turns out that uh, the early stages in life, the eggs and the little babies are very vulnerable to predation. So if you can go and do your reproducing in an area that has very low predation risk, uh, that's a good thing to do. So that's exactly what our salmon are doing. They're going into the fresh water, up to those streams. It's pretty, pretty sterile up there. Uh, there's a very high survival of, um, of, the, of the babies that hatch out. They grow a little while there and come down to sea, and then they really do the growing up in the ocean. But in the tropics, it's actually the river. What is the sterile part that's got nothing in it? It's the ocean. All that beautiful tropical water you can see all the way. The reason you can see all the way down there is because there's nothing there. <laughs> there's nothing there. So that's, this, whereas the, the streams on land are really rich in biologic, you, you don't want to put your, so you have the reverse. And so in general, there's a general rule. The, the species of fish that go to sea to spawn and grow up in fresh water are tropical. And those that go the other way, as we know it, are temperate. But in each case, it is moving a reproductive time to a low predation environment and the growing up time in a richer environment. And in the tropics, it happens to be the reverse what it is in the temperate zone. And that's why we've got. So what we have then, not only in, um, do we have salmon, but salmon, the salmon is the salmon family, is all, all north temperate. None of them, until we decided to move them down there and make salmon farms and down in the southern hemisphere, there were no such things like salmon in the southern hemisphere. So these uh, streams down in, in Chile, for, where we now have salmon and salmon farms, they didn't have anything like that. And, and there was probably one of the reasons is, if you see there's no land down there, no backup, no, no place to go. And the, this. so at any rate, until uh, we, we decided to change all of this in the southern hemisphere. Uh, there weren't any of these uh, anadromous fishes kind of doing anything down there. So none of that enrichment. But up in the northern hemisphere, as we said, we got a lot of land. And in fact, the watershed of the north temperate rainforest, our temperate, is enormous. And the, the salmon, until we decided to b b bum it up, uh, the salmon were going all the way up to the Rockies. And we have enormous migrations of salmon going great distances uh, to the Rockies and way up through into Canada and the, and the Canadian Rockies there and through the interior. So these salmon went enormous different distances. Uh, and we, so we had enormous populations of, of these fish uh, that uh, had a huge area in which to spawn. And, and these, these are all up and down. The, the, the Columbia River was probably the biggest 
uh, run of all because you had a huge area until we built the Grand Coulee Dam. There's nothing to stop them, and they went all and they went all the way. And uh, some of them got landlocked. So if you go to the, the lakes and, and Glacier National Park west of the Continental Divide, you have landlocked sockeye salmon. They don't ever go to sea. They spawn in little rivers and they, they grow up there. And they don't get very big, and we call them kokanee. Those are landlocked sockeye salmon that got up there. But they don't get very big. That's kind of a, not a place they could get very big. It's a much more sterile. But they're doing all right. But uh, they're sockeye salmon, but they mature. They're a very small size. And that's why we give them a different name. So uh, we have this enormous, so this enormous watershed of, of both, particularly the Columbia River, which was huge going up. Into, into the Canadian Rockies and the, and the U.S. Rockies, hum, enormous watershed, all of which was good for salmon migrations. And so we had um, vast numbers of transfer stuff going back and forth, uh, moving nutrients, and, and uh, had a big effect on this whole region. Um, and uh, nothing like that has was anywhere else in the world, because none of these places was a land, a land base where you could have all of this happen. This is a peculiar feature of the north temperate rainforest of the Pacific coast here. So they're very unlike anything else. Um, and uh, this relationship, which we're all really familiar with, is, is one that uh, we're privileged to see it because nobody else can see it. So let me see, what, what did I do here? Oops. Oh, Which one are you my I want to get the next one. The, the uh, not, not a piece through. No, the, 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 there's another one coming. I think it was this one. There we go. There we go. Okay. Now, there we are. This is the Tongass National Forest. This, okay. And I want to zero in. We're now, now I'm getting very, very local, because uh, here uh, we have a very interesting biogeographic patterns. And in thinking about what kind of conservation do we want to do, we can take advantage of this. Uh, and so uh, the Tongass National Forest, uh, which covers most of this area, is in southeast Alaska. It's the largest national forest in the U.S. And it's for thousands of islands. It's also unusual in this way. And of course, uh, it's a national forest. So where in the bureaucracy of the federal government is the Forest Service located? Agriculture, right? Department of Agriculture. So the foresters th think of the, this is just a nice, pretty, magnificent woody cornfield. Uh, and so harvesting is it. And you remember, you all, uh, 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 the, the, when, uh, um, what's his name, uh, Ron Zegers, bid on the Tongass, uh, on the, f not the Tongass, but the uh, f timber sale on the east side of the, uh, of the Cascades, he bid on it and got it and then announced that he wasn't going to cut the trees. And all hell broke loose. You can't buy Mitch Friedman in the Pacific Northwest, and he talked to her about it some time ago. Uh, he said, I'm not going to cut the trees. And they said, well, you can't buy on a timber thing, sale and not cut the trees. And it was all hell broke loose. And, he, and they wanted to cancel it and that you weren't allowed to do this. So this is the, the um, mental set. Forests are to cut trees. Um, and when we get up to here, and as I want to talk about management in the, in the Tongass, that's going to be only one of the things we think about. And there's, only, there's good reasons why we don't think about the other things. But reason, what we've been doing with this, uh, really good big trees uh, that are wonderful for stuff, are very limited distribution in this forest. Because it's, it's very, very mountainous, scrubby stuff. And only on some of the river plains and stuff are the, the really big trees. Those are the ones you can really do. So what have we been doing? 
We've been cutting those trees and sent unprocessed logs to Japan where they've been used as scaffolding. And then what do we do? We ship Douglas firs up from Washington State to enable people to build things in Southeast Alaska. It's really a crazy, crazy relationship. Uh, and I'm gonna have something more to say about that. But anyway, here's, here is the, 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 the Tongass National Forest. And it looks complicated because it is. Um, but um, remember that 15,000 years ago, this was all under ice. So everything has moved in here very, very recently. And they come in in different ways. And again, this is not a watershed boundary there because the rivers are coming through this. And uh, uh, animals have colonized. And some of them have come in from the north down to the top. And some of them have come from the southeast. And so we have the, the three big islands on, on the north, the ABC Islands, Admiralty, Bar Baranoff, and Chickagoff islands, the three big islands up there, they all have brown bears. Get down to the southern islands, the biggest of which is the Prince of Wales down there. And there you have black bears and wolves. And the wolves are out there catching fish. The Alexander Archipelago wolf, which is a smaller wolf than the, some of the interior ones, it's there fishing. And so, We've had a colony, and the black bears are doing the fishing there too. So that this is a, a marvelous place. So this is one example of of species colony colonized. The the wolves and the, and the black bears came in from the southeast through the, some of the guy, and the brown bears came in from the north, and we got different stuff. But there's also evidence that in these islands uh, there wasn't complete submergence by by ice. And there, uh, along the, the, the coastal margins there, there are some endemic plants, which says they had to have been there during the Ice Age, and on little cliffs and stuff right on the coast, they've survived. And there was a caribou population up on one of those islands that's gone extinct in modern times. So the, and there's also, interestingly enough, a, a species of marten, one of the, the big weasels, that's endemic to this coastal area, and it's found nowhere else, and there's the common martin, which is everybody else is also there, but that indicates that there were some places that things survived the glaciation right on the coast. And we know that's also how our ancestors got here. They came, they got to walk across the Bering, which was dry then, uh, and, and got into Alaska. And they had, had good enough boats, they came down the coast. And they kept going down the coast, and they went all the way down to southern South America with a, a rather small amount of time. And this is how our ancestors came. And there were, and during, it was still pretty, pretty much uh, a, a lot of, of ice before it opened up on the interior. So the earliest colonization of uh, North America by people came along the coast in boats here. And so there's a, a evidence of early, early uh, occupation here. And it was very rich because you have uh, all the marine resources. And it's interesting, this area of the North Pacific Coastal Rainforest is, I think, the only place on Earth where human beings developed a sedentary culture with cities and buildings and not going anywhere that wasn't based on agriculture. Everywhere else, I think, it came with ag. You didn't settle down. You were nomadic until you had the resources that were provided by agriculture. This area, you have the really rich, rich coastal resources whales and everything else, and these people who are really good at catching whales. Uh, they, they've re, re, relearned how to do it. I remember out on the Olympic Peninsula, they, they wanted to harvest a couple of whales, and there was a big controversy about it. Finally, they were allowed to do it, but they had forgotten how to do it. And they, it's not easy to go hunting whales with these little crafts. They finally figured it out, but uh, these were ardent whalers, so they were able to take advantage of these, this resource and were able to build s villages and houses and stuff like that with no agriculture. And this is the only place on earth where I think that happened. And uh, that's r rather exciting. So we got all of this really complicated kind of um, uh, pattern here, that more of which, most of it involves interesting stuff, mammals, because the birds get around and they, 
they fly around and it hasn't been long enough for new species to form, although some of the, uh, the bird species on some of the islands are already notably distinct and uh, they're, they're in the process of speciating and it's going to happen with time, but there hasn't been enough time for it yet. Uh, the mammals are starting to, you've got some mammals on some of the islands that are now dis quite distinct, they're becoming isolated. And we're going to watch as we see this rainforest go forward, we're going to see species developing. And that's going to be one of the exciting things to see. That, and noting these pair, different patterns, I would just described the most striking one of bears and wolves distribution. There's more to it without going into details of little rodents that you won't care about. Um, that one of the things that in thinking about managing this forest, we want to understand that this is in the process of being colonized. And, it, and as it warms up, more and more things are going to come. And what we're seeing now and what we want to plan for conservation is not what it's going to be in the future. So as we think about what to do in this area and how to plan for conservation, we, we got to plan and we want to be concerned about biodiversity, which is pretty interesting here. And the speciation is going to occur, and this is going to be a pretty exciting place to watch what happens. Uh, we've got a plan for a future that is quite different than what we see today. So I want to sort of close with talking a little bit about uh, well, how should we think about managing this forest? What are the rules that should guide us? And some of this grows out of the workshop that we, we had here. Um, and some of it is just what I'm coming up with. But first thing, immediately stop cu cutting any old growth. Stop. This is the only forest in which they're still cutting old growth. And this is extremely important here because with the slow growth rate of the trees, I mean, it, it takes hundreds of years to recapture old growth. And if you have a typical setting site, 60 to 100 years, work, you will never get any old growth. So uh, you've got to stop. And you've got to think about, we've lost a lot generating some new stuff. So, so in order to do that, I think the, the, the thing that you ought to do is to set up experimental watersheds. To, decide that these are some watersheds that we're going to manage simply for the forest and mature and biodiversity. We're not going to cut anything. So we should establish a set of, of uh, watersheds that have different characteristics. And they're going to be left alone. And these are the ones where we're going to slowly regenerate more old growth. And we're going to see what happens in other stuff. Because you go through the cutting cycle that we would normally put in rainfall, you will never get any gold growth back here. It takes too long. So we've lost a lot of it already. If we want to regenerate some, we're going to have to have some watersheds where you don't cut anything for a long, long time. On the other hand, now this silly thing where we're shipping unprocessed logs to Japan and then shipping up Douglas fir from Washington State for stuff, that's a nutty way to do that. So we ought to develop, one, this marvelous old growth stuff that's growing very, very slowly, very, very narrow growth rings. That's wonderful for musical instruments. And that's, of course, what happened. When did Stradivarius work in Europe? The Little Ice Age. The Little Ice Age when Stradivarius, he also knew what he was doing, of course. But he had wonderful, really slow growing trees in the Alps. And we know where he got his trees. They were very, very slow growing and very narrow growth rings. That's, that's what you've got up here. So we should have an a, a, a industry of that, for that specialty thing. And it's starting already. And they're starting to make a few guitars and banjos up there. But there should be a, a very limited forestry based upon uh, selective, very careful harvesting of the old growth for this. And we should set up then a forest industry based on second growth stuff to handle all the needs of the southeast Alaskan cities. There should be an indigenous forestry there based on that. And we should not be sending up Douglas fir logs from Washington State 
for the stuff up there. So we can re redo this this thing and have uh, 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 there's there's enough second growth and and there's not that many cities and stuff in southeast Alaska that the need for for timber is not extensive. It can be done with very selective second growth that will be on a sustainable basis, and we should do that. We should also then be carefully monitored. We should have uh, scientists monitoring what's happening with the biodiversity on these different islands. There's going to be new stuff coming. There's going to be speciation occurring. And it's going to be very, this is going to be an exciting, very, very exciting uh, laboratory for watching speciation happening because we're going to be on the ground floor. We're going to be watching this stuff come. We're going to see it. Uh, you're going to have to have more patience than I do, but you know, because these things take a little while. But um, this is something that we can do. So I th think we can see a pattern, a way that we might look to these forests in the future as, as ways of generating high value products, regenerating old growth. Uh, and being a biodiversity laboratory for things. And that could be, I think, a very, very exciting future for the Tongass National Forest. It has been said that it's, it's not what you look at, but what you see that's important. I've tried to get a pattern that change how you might see a forest and how what you see influences what you take from it and your future trajectory. So I've given you a little pattern here of what, how I think we might look at the, top, the temperate rainforest here and develop something interesting from that. And I hope that as a result of your listening to me today, you may look a little bit differently at the Tempic Rainforest and take something different home with you. Thank you. Question time. We have three uh, sets of microphones and waiting for you're going to do that? OK. I'm going to take five seconds of your time. We rarely are together to, to clap for someone who moved today yes. from the West Wing to the Central Tower. Jean Durning moved today. <laughs> I just had to give you her a round of applause. I mean, I visited her in her new apartment at 4 o'clock today, and it looked like Jean Durning's home. Uh, it was just wonderful. Yeah. But I'm going to do the microphone, Thank dear heart. Thank you. She's uh, <laughs> while, we're getting, while we're getting settled, let, let me take a little photo while you think about it. One of the things that's true up there uh, is that the sun is always low in the sky. You never, the sun never gets very high. Uh, and so uh, in the tropics, the sun is coming right down to the trees. So these conifers are really de delightfully good for getting sun at the low angles from the side. And it goes away around, as you know, what we see in the late, in the late June here, how, how far the sun goes to the northwest mm -hmm. before it comes mm -hmm. down. So these trees get it all the way around. And I have a question, and, and, and we'll, I'll propose it to you, and then after the end of the Q&A, we can come back to it. You decided you want to see the midnight sun. So you book in at Barrow, Alaska, the hotel, and you go out at midnight to look at the sun. What direction do you look? Ooh, trick question. Park it. We'll come back to it. <laughs> <laughs> Questions. I'm so thank told, you for my patience while I sit down, okay? I'm told that Seattle had old growth forest that was cut in 1911. Do you know anything about the history of that? I do not know that history detail, but of course, there was old growth forest all around us. And uh, there are very little pieces of it that didn't get cut, but mostly we cut the whole thing down. Uh, all of it. I don't know that particular case, but uh, almost no old growth remains at this latitude. Uh, the west side of the Olympic Peninsula is the best bit, and there are other little bits and pieces 
uh, that were cut. But by this was just too valuable. We went through and cut it all. Uh, but I don't know that particular. Schmidt's Park. Does anybody know about Schmidt's Park? Is that old growth? There's a I little bits, the yeah. little bits and pieces. It, little bits. Little bits, little mm -hmm. bits. We, each of which we ought to cherish, by the way, because we're not. Uh, we we can get it back a little faster here than up in the, up in the Tongass, because it, the trees grow faster. We got pretty good growth rates here, but still, if you want old growth, uh, you got to prepare for it in the long haul. As you go down Admiral, go what? As you go west on Admiral Avenue in West Seattle, mm -hmm. from the top of the hill where the stores are, as you go down towards Alki, Schmidt's Park in there has old growth. And as you head toward Mount Rainier, there's a little park that you can stop at, not, not, which has a wonderful bit of old growth you can walk around. And so there are lovely little bits and pieces around uh, but we didn't leave very much. But we could get it back faster than up here in the Tongass, because the trees grow a lot faster here. But we have to decide we want it. It's a political decision to, to get it back, because it doesn't, the, the cycle of that we do, the way we cut forests, and you never get it back that way. You never get old growth uh, with those cycles. So if you want it, you have, you have to decide you want it and do forestry differently. Gordon, I need to say thank you for mentioning the Stikine River. I, Roy and I, went 150 miles up, flew up in a plane, put together our Klepper full boat, and paddled 150 miles down the Stikine River. Oh, thank you for mentioning the Stikine. Wonderful rivers, wonderful rivers. <laughs> Any other questions? Stunned. Stunned. Bored. I don't know which. No, stunned or bored. <laughs> you might want to sit uh, you, you didn't. I, I'm curious at this map. What what is reflected in the dark green and the light green and the brown? What what is what's uh, this, going on there? What? Well, uh, on the map, I didn't go into it, but, but some of it is 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 uh, protected areas. For example. Admiralty Island there is protected as an old growth island and nothing can be done with it. So uh, these areas that are dark green have special protection. That's Got all. It. Sorry I didn't mention that. Brown. And the brown up there is, um, see that is, what is that? That's getting up there to Glacier Bay and uh, uh, I'm not sure about that, but anyway, that's the northern end of it, and it's getting kind of cold up there. <laughs> okay. Gordon, Gordon, is the Weyerhaeuser Company doing anything to help regenerate the forests around here? Well, by and large, the Weyerhaeuser Company is a tree cutting company and makes its money cutting cutting trees. Uh, they have been helpful with leaving a little bits and pieces in places. They recognize that that's good PR. But uh, they're the tree cutting company. That's how they make their money. And they do a bit for PR. But, uh, but they're no worse than anybody else. You know, I mean, it, but our whole cultural thing was trees are to cut. And as I mentioned, Mitch Friedman, when he did when the Loomis, and he bought a bid on it. And by the way, he didn't have the money when he bid on it, and he was counting on somebody would bail him out if he got it. He did it. But again, you can't bid on a forest cut and not cut it. Mm -hmm. You know, that was, we're changing that. We're beginning to see forests in a little bit broader context now than we did, but they were woody cornfields. Yes? Gordon, don't let us go home without telling us where to find the midnight sun. Okay, <laughs> go back to, how many of you said looking east? Nobody. How many said south? How many said west? How many said north? How many said up? <laughs> How many didn't guess? 
more. OK, the correct answer is north. And if you don't understand why, ask somebody who voted north or come to see me. But the basic answer is that we're twisting. The, the sun just keeps going, right? And when we see it way in the northwest going down in the evening here, and then it's coming up in the northeast in the morning when none of you are up to see it, the sun just keeps going mm -hmm. around. And so right. when you get further north, it doesn't uh, set at all, but it just keeps going. One of the most beautiful uh, nights I ever spent was we went to Svalbard, Spitsbergen, and went around the north end of Spitsbergen, and, mm -hmm. and it was 80-some uh, 80, 80 degrees north. And it was easy. And just watch as the sun just went and it just went along the horizon like this and hit the southern, the northern uh, slopes of the island. And I just couldn't go to bed. I just watched. The sun was just going along like that and then coming back up. And it's a wonderful. But the sun just keeps, doesn't stop and come back around or anything. It just keeps going. And as a matter of fact, even uh, in as south as Vancouver, the sun doesn't get low enough that tip. Officially, there is no total dark in Vancouver, BC. It was legally twilight. Mm -hmm. And as you get further north, it gets lighter and lighter and lighter at twilight. Mm -hmm. uh, and so uh, the sun is so little below, you can still read something all night. It just barely gets below until you finally get up above, uh, above the Arctic Circle, which the Arctic Circle was drawn there where during the, during the 21st of June, the sun doesn't completely go down. That's how that line is drawn. Mm -hmm. That's where it is. And so that you get uh, the sun never quite disappearing. And as you get a little further north, of course, it never goes down. But the sun gets flatter and flatter and flatter. It never gets off very well. The sun is going out at a very, very shallow angle. Mm -hmm. And that's what partly these conifers are all about, getting the, the sun coming in at low angles. It never, mm -hmm. it never goes to get up very high. Look at the conifer, it's perfect for that, getting the sun at low angles all around. So, Warden, I'm over here. <laughs> no, right. Oh, well, okay. <laughs> hi, hi, Ina, hey. Uh, yeah, white nights in St. Petersburg, very romantic. But uh, what about Siberia? What about the rivers? What about those huge forests? Are those. Uh, do they have large trees? Do they well, have anything like the rainforest? Okay, the, the vast areas across Alaska and Canada and all across Siberia that are boreal forests. Uh, but they are not very wet. They have dry, uh, that's why they're burning up because it gets, it gets very hot and dry. And some of the hottest weather in summer comes in some of those areas. And that's what the big problem we're having now. It's burning up. So these are boreal forests. They're conifer forests uh, and, and some other deciduous stuff with them. But they're not wet enough to classify as rainforests. They're pretty dry, and which is the big problem now. That's why they're burning up, uh, because it's getting a little drier. And we're getting un unprecedentedly hot weather up there. And we've had vast burning of, of the boreal forest but all, all over. In Can We've been getting our, our terrible smoke in the summer from boreal forest fires in Canada coming down from us. And all across, we've had massive fires in the boreal forest. But that's not rainforest. And that's a, the rainforest, big burning up is not the problem. It's landslides and stuff like that and wind throws. But it's huge forest, but it's, it's too dry. Warren, yeah. when I lived in Alaska, Anchorage, four and a half years, and one of my most exciting times was in the middle of summer, around June 21st, running up to the top of the hill above us, down in Bootlegger's Cove with the children, and watching the sun almost go down and start to come up. Yeah. <laughs> it's wonderful it to do beautiful. it if you have a chance to see it, because it's, it's not what you expect. The sun's supposed to go down, right? And then it doesn't, and it's really wonderful. I mean, uh, that evening on the north side of Spitsbergen, I just was so excited. 
I finally had to drag myself to bed. Cause like, okay, cause I'm gonna have to do with something the next morning. But just watching it just go along the horizon, just uh, it was really great. No, the northern lights were right above you. Yeah. And they were like big green curtains that just fluttered across the sky. Yeah. It's marvelous. It's marvelous. So anyway, uh, I do encourage you to go somewhere and see the midnight sun. And do remember, look north. <laughs> right, right. OK, thank you very much. John, if you want to know about the dark green and light green, I can tell you about that, because I worked for the Wilderness Society for 10 years. Thank you all very much for coming. And thank you, Gordon. Thank you, thank you, thank you.